and my instinct is to start introducing my podcast and I think that that's always a sort of uh, a funny dynamic when podcasters start speaking to each other on each other's podcast that there's almost a kind of a, a, a little power dynamic where we're used to being the one asking the questions and getting to wear the mask and um yeah feel slight I don't know do you feel slightly exposed when you get interviewed Vanessa yeah for sure mm -hmm. absolutely I'm used to being on this side all the time as the analyst and the interviewer yeah um well it's really nice to meet you and it's it's kind of um a relief actually to speak to um somebody whose whole business is psychoanalysis because uh, uh the popular show well we we have spoken to the odd psychoanalyst it, it it's always the sort of it's the lens rather than the topic and the the guests tend to be political or more broadly cultural so yeah i'm i'm excited to yeah talk to someone who's kind of in the you know really in the psychoanalytic groove how did your podcast come about how did you decide to develop it um it really came from lockdown in in a, in a number of ways uh one was i i mean you know people, i've been talking to friends and collaborators over the sort of the, the previous few years when podcasts were really becoming one of the like big cultural forms and you know people would say are you going to do a podcast are we going to do a podcast and and I, something about it didn't quite appeal but then in lockdown um a, a friend Alfie Bown and uh, a few others and I started hosting these sort of zoom discussions and then we started interviewing people and it just became more and more podcast like at the same time I, I had this tremendous tremendous writer's block during the lockdown period and also found it so uncongenial to be trying to write whilst trapped at home I'm much more of a, a coffee house guy or a writing on the train kind of guy and so yeah the, 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 I kind of accidentally ended up with the the basis of a podcast form uh, at the very time that I needed it to get things off my chest when I, I suddenly found myself unable to write and uh, then yeah, towards the end of 2020, I got involved with David Slavic, who had been um, involved in the Michael Brooks show, and Michael Brooks had just died, so he was looking for a, a new sort of, you know, left-wing podcast project, so we we got in together, so I, yeah, I, and now I'm stuck with it. Uh, there is a sort of, I don't know, do you find this, that, that there's a kind of compulsion there, you don't always want to do it, and yet it's you must that <laughs> that the, maybe there's something to be said for that kind of serial form that imposes its, its own discipline that you if you're meant to be writing something you can always not write and everybody knows that writing deadlines are, are sort of fake whereas you know that topic's going to be gone if you don't do it now that guest you know you know, you might not get them back if you don't speak to them now so yeah for uh, I guess that's the that's the way it came about. Um, I mean, the other thing to say about the, the popular show is that it was it was conceived to um, kind of be a, a, a form for dealing with failure. It, it, it really came out of the failure of the big left populist projects of the long 2016. Uh, Corbyn had been defeated in the 2019 election. Bernie uh, had been squeezed out of the presidential nomination uh, and it, it seemed to me anyway that the left had failed and was not dealing with that failure well was not responding to the new crises that were coming about uh, in I mean I'm in therapeutic companies so I'm, I'm going to say in a healthy way uh, so yeah I, I mean we the other nice thing about podcasts as as you well know is that it's sort of like a scrapbook and it's sort of like you you get to have this curating power curatorial power where um you can bring together like just weird shit that you like and pin it onto onto this uh this form i mean when bob dylan comes to he's 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 in your part of the world right now but when he comes to britain i'm going to do a couple of shows based on uh 
based on performances Dylan is doing uh, in the country. What's that got to do with left politics? Well, you'll find out when I, <laughs> when I say on the episodes. But yeah, it, it, it's a nice mixture of the, the impersonal. Uh, no, you've got to deal with this event or this current like topic right now. And the highly personal, it, 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 it's, it, it's so unedited and unscrutinized for now, at least. Absolutely. But I like that. I like when they're like really free associative and you just run with the discussion and see where it leads. Yeah. And how did your interest in psychoanalysis come about? Um, very much on paper. I'm a, a, a lecturer in English literature and yeah, I, I got my, my Freud and my Lacan and my Melanie Klein um, from my my PhD supervisor, overwhelmingly um, Jeremy Tambling, a Dickens and Dante scholar. Um, so I guess my my psychoanalysis in the first instance is that cultural studies, English literature psychoanalysis, the way that it was kind of brought in house by um, Anglo American literature departments over the seventies, eighties, nineties, um, and sort of brought together with various forms of critical theory since then i i I've, I've slightly kind of drifted in other directions as far as what i think is important about psychoanalysis is concerned but yeah the, the origin was not from a psychology background was not from having aspirations for um yeah going into to, to practice or, or analysis myself or indeed going in as a patient or analyzant it was in the first instance, here is one of the available tools for understanding Shakespeare or, or, or Robert Browning. Um, subsequently, it was more like Freud is a great, is one of the great writers and one of the great thinkers and is a, an essayist in the kind of long Renaissance tradition. Lacan is one of the great avant-garde artists as well as uh, a, a, a huge philosophical innovator um yeah the, these days uh, it's more that as i i moved to write on other things and, and participate in, in in more political activism and and commentary it, it's that those kind of lessons of psychoanalysis don't seem any more to be as i said one of the kind of formalist available ways of understanding cultural artifacts or, or texts or artists not not so much that or not only that they just seem to be the most profound truths about how humans interact with each other and organize each other uh, and i think that that is something that is greatly underestimated in much of our political and cultural discourse that that that, that so much of what we say when we talk about politics and so much of what we do when we design our shared infrastructure, which today overwhelmingly means digital infrastructure, uh, is done in what is really a pre-Freudian manner. It's almost like Freud never happens when we hear uh, so much analysis of what motivates people in, uh, in their politics and what motivates them in their, um, in their leisure or, or free time online. Absolutely. Um, I thank all of the English literature and humanities professors for keeping psychoanalysis alive, because it's certainly not so alive in psychology yeah. departments. <laughs> it, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny. English literature has often kind of had the, as a, as a university subject, has often had the role as a sort of archivist uh, uh, that we keep the thinkers from the other disciplines on the boil as it were uh, until their disciplines are ready for them it's true of Nietzsche uh, uh, that for a long time you'd have to go to an English department if you wanted to study Nietzsche the philosophers wouldn't touch him uh, and perhaps it remains true of Marx <laughs> one day the economists will be ready will you talk a little bit about that about this kind of interconnection and the way people use like Nietzsche, Marx, Freud, Lacan, like together in theory? 
Yeah, uh, I, I mean, the, it, it is interesting to look back on, a, a, on that kind of high theory sort of phase of, of cultural criticism and scholarship, that there was a funny, um, there, there was almost, well, one sort of disparaging term that, that got used sometimes was theory soup. Uh, and Ballantyne Cunningham updated that for the post-colonial era by referring to theory gumbo. Uh, this sort of way that a, an almost kind of magpie-like excitement would would sort of lead, lead scholars to, um, to, you know, just be overwhelmingly impressed by these these French, German, Italian thinkers, and, and to want to kind of bring them together. Um, increasingly, I, 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 I feel like there's, there's more to be done by keeping them slightly more discreet. I, I, I think that um, I think that Lacan is 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 far more powerful and interesting if taken in his particularity. I, I, and I, I no longer want to sort of see the overlaps with with Foucault or Derrida or what or, or Althusser and, and and prefer to see these people that that kind of that remarkable post-war generation of, of of thinkers who who brought together sociology and aesthetics and their own home discipline uh it, it's interesting that they haven't been replaced that there was something about that um to repeat the formulation long 1968 that produced something so dynamic in thought, uh, and then the next generation couldn't do much better than to uh, continue sort of picking it over and translating it and, 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 and trying to understand its significance. I think that they probably need to be, well, yeah, maybe just because they haven't been replaced and something about the times and something about the economy and something about the structure of university knowledge and, and and other kinds of knowledge means that we, we don't have those kind of charismatic figures right now. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that it, it uh, yeah, just to answer the question straight, I, I, I prefer them to be slight, slightly separate, even if um, I do think that psychoanalysis holds us, as I said before, holds a certain key to understanding politics which very often gets underestimated maybe i should say something about that yes, what i mean absolutely. by that I, I, I said, I'm, I'm being vague um well the the, the point where I, I really started to think that was um what was in was in 26 well with 2016 the uh, 2016 the brexit referendum the um the 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 trump victory uh, and other kind of less explosive, but um, indications of a similar drift elsewhere in, in the West. This uh, came with a, a, a new sort of allergy to what was called populism. And that became the sort of watchword of the moment. It, it, it's kind of interesting that right now uh, with Italy, we're not hearing so much about populism. We're, we're hearing about fascism, and I, I think that that's because the left has been defeated. When, it, when it's only the, the the radical right that seems to be um, powerful or a threat, you can talk about fascism. But back then, you also had Bernie and Corbyn to worry about. So populism became the preferred term um, as a kind of, and this was the the title of the book I wrote at the time, other people's politics. No, the normal politics is is centrist, technocratic, uh, and sort of shrugs morosely at the fact that, alas, politicians can't give people or electorates or the needy what they need or or what they want. Populists are those uh, irresponsible and dangerous figures on the right and the left who are saying actually these these rules that we've lived by these hierarchies that we've lived by uh in this era of neoliberalism don't have to be followed and we can pursue other um 
other, other ways of, of, do, of doing politics. That, that, was, that was highly unacceptable to mainstream thinking. And I, I didn't really see it that way. I, I had been so politically molded by the post-2008 um, uh, uh, cuts to state spending in, in Britain uh, by the austerity agenda and just the absolute barbarism that had gone on, this, this hollowing out of the public sphere, the, these innovative new ways that the state had developed in order to simply cast people out of the system altogether. That had been so brutal and had been done with the applause or at least the toleration of so many allegedly good liberal uh, people. I mean, the, 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 that Conservative government did all that in coalition with the Liberal Democrats. Uh, that, fr frankly, I was very happy to see what would happen with the roll of the dice. Trump, obviously, I remember watching his inauguration speech, uh, all that stuff about American carnage written by Steve Bannon. And of course, I was chilled by it and frightened by it. At the same time, I, I absolutely had no truck with what had gone immediately before. And what seemed distinctive about this new populism was that as, as much as people um, cascaded so-called populists for proposing to give give people what they want you know th th this is lowest common denominator stuff this is trump will say anything in order to get elected the brexiteers will say that you know anything can happen after brexit uh, and they're lying to people all that kind of discourse of fake news which has become the discourse of disinformation today the whole kind of mindset was that people are just idiots and are, are being tricked by these these populist politicians but i didn't see it that way at all and, and i and i still don't what i saw happening uh with that populist moment was at, at last in a way political figures and movements were reckoning with the nature of desire as such. This was the most sophisticated engagement with desire in politics that I'd ever seen. Uh, it, 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 was, it, it was not so much that, you know, people out there have their, you know, desires and then a politician comes and says, I'm going to give you what you want. It seemed to me that there was something much more psychoanalytic in, in the offer that was going on. As your listeners will have heard this argument many times, but Freud's innovation was not the Oedipus complex or the unconscious. People have been mindful of, 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 of these kind of structures since the ancients. The, the, the real innovation was in that separation of desire and object, uh, what Lacan would come to refer to as the, as the drive, this way in which we start, we are sub, the entry price to subjectivity is that we are shot through like lightning with this um, uh, uh, invisible and impossible to understand and impossible to satisfy, headless, as Lacan puts it, drive. Uh, and we are almost, our subjectivity is almost built around this highly unstable, um, momentum, which will latch onto things, conventionally a person or object, but of course it can be in, 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 in classic neurosis, it can be an idea, it can even be um, a, a certain kind of intraction, something far more intersubjective, it can be a part of my own desiring constitution. Um, the fact that yeah, that, that, that manner in which um, Freud to Lacan uh, uh, revolutionizes the idea of the subject as in fact the subject of desire, at the same time as revolutionizing the idea of the object, that it, 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 can, be, it can be something that wouldn't be conventionally recognized as an object. Now, that is the, um, that's the, the, that's the tragedy of, of desire, in a sense, that, that, that we have to live like this, always wanting 
never fulfilled. Uh, and the, the fact that, yeah, de desire is most fundamentally a question or an irresolution. What it seems to me Trump was doing was almost recognizing that. And it was not so much that he was giving people what they wanted as if they knew what they wanted. Rather, it was this performance of desire being satisfied. It was this performance of a totally impossible relationship to desire. So when he would say things like Hillary Clinton can't even satisfy her husband, how can she satisfy the American people? Or I think that was a retweet rather than something he actually said. When he said you can grab them by the pussy, uh, you can do what you want. Uh, when he said, uh, uh, I'm going to keep winning and you're going to say, we can't take it anymore. You're going to have to stop winning, Mr. President. And, and I'm going to say, no, we're going to keep winning. All of those kinds of statements where it was, you know, of course, in the first instance, it was seen in terms of, it, you know, it, it, is this misogynistic? Uh, is, is, is this a, a kind of normalization of rape language, etc.? All, all that was, was, was a perfectly reasonable kind of criticism. But what it led us to miss was the extent to which this was a presidential candidate who constantly spoke at the edge of desire and constantly spoke um, as somebody who seemed to have no friction whatsoever. When Boris Johnson um, became uh, prime minister in, in 2019 um, in Britain, I, I, th there was a sort of moment where it seemed like the left was gathering to try to sort of attack him on, ground, on the grounds that he was too lazy or too self-indulgent or had too many affairs. And it seemed like this was, or, or said, you know, racist things. And it seemed like this was like absolutely a kind of way to make the same mistake that American liberals had made over Trump, that, that, that uh, in, in, in criticizing these um, acts of desire, it, it, you, you, were, you were misreading them as the kind of unfortunate foible of the politician, as opposed to the absolute core of their offer. The performance of Trump, the performance of the Brexiteers who seem to be promising to reconcile totally irreconcilable forms of uh, post-Brexit governance, was that th th this was not politics as saying, alas, we can't do this anymore, that option no longer exists, uh, we have to make cuts, etc. This was politics as, um, a, a, as, as a performance of, of reconciled desire, because there's a, there's a history to this after all. It, it's not like the Freudian century, you know, was just a kind of, um, was just happening in the vacuum of the couch. Freud inaugurated a century that um, was characterized by a sort of consumer capitalism, which was predicated on constantly raising the game in terms of what people should expect as far as desire is concerned. And then in the middle of the century, it clicked its fingers and that post-war settlement became neoliberalism and the volume was turned up on what we should expect as far as desire is concerned at the same time as possibility became more and more compressed. That happened economically through the massive rise of inequality, so that desire was set loose as it was enclosed. Uh, and it also happened culturally with increasing monopolization of culture, uh, such that we lost that kind of bohemianism of the of, of the of the 60s and, and the mid-century. Everything became more owned, paid for, censored, controlled. So we, we, we've lived through a time where our, our drive has never been so encouraged uh, at the same time as it has been enclosed and forbidden. And, and that's what that that as much as anything was what that populist 2016 was about. This libidinal release and a kind of politics that seemed to fit with how we are as desiring subjects. No, that makes perfect sense. And I love the way you're applying psychoanalytic uh, understanding to these political uh, movements and, and figures. Um, yeah, and, and then when you had, like you said, in 2016, we had Bernie there who who's offering, you know, 
more more benefits for more people mm -hmm. um but it's still in a very kind of structured way a way that would be possible <laughs> yeah but it's not like uh i mean i think if he had been the nominee as opposed to hillary you know he would have had a chance uh so maybe maybe we would we would have seen a better fight between these two um but yeah but when you have hillary against this like yeah totally uncastrated man who's just getting everything he wants all the time is totally satisfied yeah of course he wins and of course you know there's help from russia and everything yeah well there was a difference between the bernie of 2016 and the bernie of 2020 just as there was a, di a difference between the jeremy corbyn of 2017 and of 2019 uh and this is where we realized that the, there was a very narrow gap in which the left w was able to play this game of desire. Uh, and there, there was a moment, and, and this is what I was trying to react to and promote, and I, I, I went all over the country to labor groups and, and left groups, basically you know, talking about this. There was, a, there was a window where the left was able to occupy that space and, and i mean a simple way to kind of um describe it would be that the whole kind of dirtbag left ethos of of chapo trap house in the states this kind of way that uh you were you were suddenly able to differentiate this kind of bernie socialism from this kind of hectoring totally hypocritical liberalism that that, that wanted to scold the deplorables uh but had nothing at all to offer anybody apart from that there was there, there was a moment of, of of differentiation of the left from that and 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 it helped in britain it helped actually for a moment that corbyn was so reviled by mainstream media types that it, it made it very difficult for the right to do the thing they always do sometimes um with justification which is to characterize the left as just kind of um shills of the establishments these days that, that that's that they've lost any kind of radical revolutionary capability and now just defend the, the status quo we were able to kind of wriggle out of that and in fact be this kind of libidinal thing that looked like it was a hell of a lot of fun to be involved with that 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 that's something that's forgotten about 2017 and and the the the, the surprise almost victory of, of corbyn in that election was the people wanted to be involved in Corbynism because it seemed like that's where the good time was happening. By 2019, we'd we'd lost that, and 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 for both Bernie and Corbyn, that happened at a policy level, uh, a, a kind of drift of the policies towards establishment liberalism, most uh, profoundly in in the the remain the, the drift away from. Um, a kind of left-wing Brexit that, that we were offering in 2017 and, and towards the, the disastrous um, backing of a second referendum where we could no longer say that we were you know, part of populism. Instead, we were now part of the establishment. Um, and, well, you know, but the, the, the way that Bernie has uh, just been brought completely in-house in, in the Biden administration, and, and the same goes for the squad. All of these are examples of the left losing that kind of that that that, that sense of the, the libid libidinal that it had around 2016, 2017, and that's before we even get on to the huge enclosure of the libidinal and the populist that was lockdowns. Right, of course. We'll say more about that. Well, <laughs> um, where, where to begin, really? Uh, I, I, I think that um, those lockdown policies, absolutely extraordinary in the way that they were totally unprecedented. Uh, and, you know, there are WHO documents from December 2019 that explicitly rule out universal lockdowns. So somehow, uh this policy became went from being un, unspeakable and, and and uh there was no circumstances in which it, it would be introduced it went from that to being treated as if it were the eternal norm and the 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 only thing that anyone could do and that you were guilty of disinformation uh, or, or or worse eugenics if you um if if you even 
you know, never mind opposed, if you even asked for uh, an explanation. So the, yeah, the, the, the lockdowns were tremendous closing down of the libidinal, their whole kind of premise that we could live separate, the whole kind of premise that we could, uh, you know, live in our own kind of tiny cubicles, uh, connected only by the mediation of these digital platforms, the, these Web 2.0 platforms. Th this was this was a punishment in some ways, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that this was a conscious conspiracy, at least not in this specific regard. But there was an element of this that that was that was punishment by policymakers, and in all the support that maximal COVID measures had among professional class people in general, who often had quite nice places to work from home, and their job often wasn't particularly different. It was already totally alienated anyway in the workplace. Uh, so of course they supported it. There, there was a kind of punishment logic to this uh, and, and a kind of um, closing down of all of that gathering energy, all of that intersubjective energy, and all of that unpredictable kind of acting out of group desire that we'd seen on the right and the left over the immediate previous years. There, there were probably a fair uh, few people at the top who were completely relieved to have to um, hit pause on everything uh, in that way. And well, I, I, I mean, one way to, to read the, the Black Lives Matter um, protests is that uh yeah sure many people were, were were there in a highly straightforward kind of cause and effect sort of way it's seen a, a great racial injustice that seemed to have its avatars across the whole culture and so they went out and they protested i think for a lot of people there was also this kind of this relief that there was um as it were a socially acceptable form of chaotic carnivalesque assembly that was suddenly Permitted that there was a, a sort of a strange moment where um, the the your your kind of archetypal professional class person, you know, looked from side to side. Oh, hang on, I I, I support maximal COVID uh, 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 suppression measures, but I also am getting involved and, and radicalized by this new. Uh, focus on race, I kind of look from side to side, oh, oh fuck it, I'm going out and, uh, and I'm protesting. I mean, the, the, um, you only have to look at the sort of Kyle Rittenhouse affair to see something of that, like th this, this, <laughs> this incredible kind of example where, of course, everybody thinks that he shot black people at, at uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, protest, but, but he didn't. The people he shot were seemingly broadly apolitical uh you know one of them was a a, a, a very mentally ill uh, uh person who well you know uh, 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 was on parole for um for ch child sex crimes uh you you had you the fact that a guy walks in with a gun and shoots some random people and they turn out to be these strange weirdos who have been brought out of the woodwork to this kind of uh, carnivalesque events uh, that that attests to some of the subtext of of, of the, the the Black Lives Matter stuff. The, the other kind of um, crucial thing about lockdowns was the the power that it gave to some of the most irresponsible companies uh, uh, that that we have. The the power that it gave to these online platforms, who I had already criticised with um, my collaborator Morella Fanabeka in work want work um, for having built this digital infrastructure on a completely irresponsible idea of what desire is. The, 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 I mean, it, it makes it sound like it was just a mistake. Maybe it wasn't. But, you know, the Facebook, Twitter, the, the social media platforms, the, the wider kind of platform infrastructure, all of it is based on well, I, do, do, should, should I explain this claim that that, yes, that, uh, that okay? So we got we got these uh, 
what happens in it, it was around 2008 it's a very interesting kind of coincidence that that you get the um you get the financial crash and then you get this you know the smartphone you get this new kind of um connectedness uh that acts as a sort of fig leaf for uh quite how bad things are going to get how do they work they work by automating decision making and automating what media or objects or, or content the user is faced with on the basis of this huge um, absorption of data. So when I'm offered a product on my Amazon account or when uh, I'm offered a, a story on, on Facebook or offered a Google uh, search result, what I'm being offered is what people like me have wanted in the past. So it, it is a technology based on people with your with your sort of character makeup that's been inferred by your internet usage wanted before now and that's what you're going to be offered um now th this this seems to me you know it's it sounds it sounds great and obviously there was a there was a period especially in the obama administration where this was treated as the most kind of revolutionary kind of brilliant solution to um to so much of the crisis of, of capitalism and and even as a kind of completion of capitalism you no longer need crude advertising you no longer need um you know the manager of a department store to choose things that the customer is likely to to want no the the, the computer knows what you want before you before you want it the famous maybe mythic story of the girl who doesn't know she's pregnant and uh starts getting you know free samples Peter has inferred that she is pregnant before she knows she is uh googling headaches and so on um well uh, yeah now what 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 was the what was the problem with this well first of all it's structurally regressive it it, it only imagines that you could want what has been wanted before or what you have wanted before or what people like you have wanted before it doesn't believe in the miracle of desire <laughs> the miracle of desire which is that um uh the person i can fall in love with or can want that the the thing the encounter that's going to lead me to totally transform my life is not something that i wanted before it, it, it it's it's a in offering us constantly the thing that was wanted previously it misses out this this unpredictable kind of leap into the unknown which is the other side of the experience of uh, the experience of desire and the other problem is that it makes the mistake of thinking that we want what we want it, it, it is pre-freudian in that regard it doesn't know or if it does know then it's extremely irresponsible to have built our entire public sphere on it and our entire politics on it ever since it it doesn't know that um very often i and the people like me have wanted and have pursued and have been fixated on and addicted to things that are extremely uh, bad for me and that if you gave me the choice i would say no just god's sake take that thing away or take that person away i, I just get get me out of this so uh, um it, it was actually quite an incredible thing to do to um, uh, make hegemonic a, a, a technology that is based on the immediate service of satisfaction when anybody could tell you that the things that we find satisfying, gratifying, etc., uh, uh, can very often be precisely the things that lead to our own destruction why why is it such a bad idea to google your symptoms um everything will be the worst kind of version of it so the most popular results will always be you know telling you that you're you're going to die and of course those are the ones you click on and and this there's this positive reinforcement of a kind of cat cat catastrophizing um if 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 you like um so yeah it, we, it's a complete nightmare that that this is the technology of desire that we all use it's a complete nightmare that it was made basically compulsory that you can't really exist as a citizen without using 
these private digital Silicon Valley companies. And then it was yet another grave sin uh, that we had these lockdowns that were based entirely on handing any kind of vestige of um, independence that was maybe still left into the hands of this technological logic. So yeah, um, lockdowns, uh, it, 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 we've talked about it many times on, on the show, people who, who are listening and thinking that I'm, I'm being some sort of crank uh, or anti-vaxxer or whatever. You know, I, I, this is a show about psychoanalysis, so I went, I went drone on about uh, the, the, the other kind of questions this raises, but just psychoanalytics, uh, psychoanalytically speaking, this was the effect of lockdown was this kind of enclosure of the intersubjective dimension of desire, this, this punishment for all of that political libido that had gone on in the previous years, and a making hegemonic of what Mark Fisher calls the depressive hedonia, the depressive hedonism of constant clicking and affirmation and refreshing of this technology that knows how to give us this immediate satisfaction but it's the satisfaction of scratching the skin around your fingernails or of pulling your hair out or of depressing depressively eating something that you don't even take pleasure in it, it, it all of all of uh, the desire and pleasure that silicon valley has to offer us is the the pleasure of the satisfaction of pleasureless um activity that, that you, you you or the the drive, the you inside you wants to do it, but you would never choose to. But now you have to. Yeah, it's just endless consumption, the clicking and the likes and just, yeah, eating the hungry ghost never is going to satisfy. Yeah, I mean, it's great. It, it, it's, you know, it, it's a structure that goes back to one of my other topics, the, the 18th century liberty. Right, the the Don uh, the Don Juan, Don Giovanni figure, who doesn't experience all of this endless, you know, Casanova endless fucking as a freedom as such as as a straightforward liberty. Um, on the contrary, it, it's it's experienced as a compulsion. And one where the present object is not, in fact, enjoyed. The, the object to come is the one that's enjoyed. And that was that movement or that theme in, in literature and, and opera was obviously tapping into something at the time. Um, but, uh, uh, I mean, the, yeah, Lacan, Lacan picks up on the, on, on the Don Giovanni figure in in seminar 20 as a, as a, a an example of the the non the sexual non relation uh and yeah i think that what 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 uh, all these platforms based on the my the collection and mining of big data and the offering us up of objects based on uh the patterns of the data that this is just a sort of incredibly bleak version of the structure of those libertines. I mean, at least they got powdered wigs and and, and nice outfits out, out of it. I love that, though, for you, that this kind of enclosing of desire ended up in you developing your podcast. It's like a way to you find your way out in in that way, find a way yeah. forward. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly, and it, it's. It is of value to me that it started in such a kind of collective form. That that it, it, its its origin was in these Zoom meetings. And I mean, a, a a friend of mine paid the compliment that the reason why it worked was not that everyone was incredibly interested in my views on where Corbynism had gone wrong, but rather that it felt like a party. And at any time, things work when they manage to seem like they're where the party is. Uh, and yeah, that that was that was needed. And yeah, I mean, of course, when, when things started to open up again, that that people don't people very rightly don't want to do their socialising on Zoom anymore. So then it moved into a more conventional form. But I, I hope that we've remembered some of the um, something of its origins. It's fun. 
Yeah, and the other thing I just wanted to mention too is with, with Trump being this kind of libidinal, uncastrated figure. It's like he still he still doesn't seem to have a limit. You know, it's like he's yeah. still not in trouble. He still doesn't get caught. He tried to overthrow the government. He sent his mob there. You know, they found all these classified documents in his in his house. Why were they there for a year and a half before they went in to get them? Like who 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 does that? Like who leaves? You know, if they knew these documents were there, why why did they take a year and a half to go get them? You know, it's just completely insane. It's it's really it's really interesting. I mean, the the turning point. Um, Matt, I remember Matt Taibbi uh, wrote this in Rolling Stone during the 2016 campaign. The the turning point was when he criticized John McCain. You know, I like the guys who didn't get captured and this was such a transgression and conventionally this is where the the candidate would apologize and you apologize uh, and then it's all over and this is why what well, apologies are a private matter you can apologize to your loved ones and your friends but apologizing to people you don't know uh, i think that that's rightly punished every time, you know, if, if you, whatever, if, if you, if someone said something on your show and you got a lot of criticism and then you apologize. No, I, I, I think that, you know, people just smell blood at that point. And Trump simply stared that down and everyone thought, okay, this is over for him. He's done, he's made that kind of unacceptable step, but he, he simply continued through it. And it turned out that actually John McCain, the war hero, wasn't such a kind of precious thing to many people. And, you know, maybe there was even a sort of nascent um, anti-war feeling that people still felt, well, why should I idolize a, a, a guy for uh, what he did in the, in the, uh, in the Vietnam War? Um, and yeah, he has, he has managed to um, carry that on. He totally, Right, and this isn't necessarily a statement of admiration, but there is a he he does inhabit the drive in that way. Uh, that that no, I didn't lose the election. There is the stub there is the stubbornness of the drive in it. I didn't lose the election. I didn't tell them to invade the Capitol building. Uh, I, I I and you know you see his rallies now, and he's actually never been funnier, uh, and he's still completely on top of his game uh and i mean yeah to respond to that having those documents in that in the house he, he's he says well as a former president i can um declassify documents in my mind like that's a, a wonderful kind of example of what freud called the omnipotence of thought in the rat man analysis that that neurotics are terrified that the you know, naughty thing that they thought has gone, has, has become real. I imagined you, you know, being ill or something, and now you are. Oh my God, I, I, my, my thoughts have escaped me. I've done this terrible thing. But Trump is a strange figure of, of having a, this kind of unneurotic relationship to the drive. Uh, and that, that's kind of nicely captured in, the, in, the, in this fantasy of uh, the president simply mentally declassifying documents. So yeah, I I've I've never done anything wrong because I I was all, always able to justify it to the drive, as it were. And he's and he's unique in that because you look at uh, the other sort of examples. Um, um, you know, Boris Johnson, as soon as he got in, immediately became. Uh, you know, had to oversee this uh, th th this kind of lockdown regime that he didn't initially want to do, uh, and then then immediately became kind of the most paid up NATO man on on Ukraine. Um, and uh, yeah, in Italy right now, uh, Giorgio Maloney. It's very telling that unlike in 2018, the last time Italy had a, a kind of populist, unexpected. Uh, uh, election outcome, the the markets just crashed, but they're totally stable in Italy right now. Uh, and it, most of these kind of populist, neo-fascist, uh, uh, unacceptable kind of leaders now get immediately kind of brought in house or or get tamed on the important issues, COVID measures, Ukraine, etc. Whereas, yeah, there, there remains something unpredictable about Trump and, and there's yeah there's a reason why he's the kind of um there's a reason why he's the prototype for this libidinal politics and in many ways its last example standing either on the right or the left 
Well, it was really nice to have you. Was there anything that you wanted to mention that we didn't get to? You have any events or anything coming up that you want to promote or? Um, well, it, it would be great if people would, uh, would check out the, the popular show. We're on, um, you know, all the, all the normal podcast channels and we'd love to see you over there and we'd love to be covering more psychoanalysis. So if more of your audience came over, we'd be incentivized to do that. Um, and, uh, I don't know if you if you wanted to see the written down version of some of the things I was saying. The, the books are other people's politics, populism to Corbynism, which came out with zero books and work want work, labor and desire at the end of capitalism, uh, which came out with Z books, which is now part of Bloomsbury. Um, but also, I really wanted to invite you on uh, the, the popular show, Vanessa, if uh, if we can find time for that. OK, absolutely. That'd be great. That would be fun. And I will link to all of your books and and the popular show in the text so that people can easily find it lovely really great to meet you thanks james bye